Now, while Jesus was just a baby at 40 days old, the righteous and devout prophet Simeon, who was looking for the redemption of Israel, had the Holy Spirit upon him, and it was revealed by the Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 26. Now Mary and Joseph had brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord. That's Luke chapter 2, verse 22 to 24. So Mary and Joseph came to the temple to carry out the custom of the law for the firstborn. And Simeon took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, thou hast did let thy bond servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at all the things which were being said about him. That's Luke chapter 2, verse 28 to 33. And then Simeon declared to Mary through the Holy Spirit that her heart would one day be crushed by the heaviest of sorrows to bear. Verse 34 and 35. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now if you could go back into the Old Testament times of Israel, every wholesome Jewish girl longed to be the mother of the promised Messiah. Perhaps part of her ritual at night was offering up this prayer. Dear God, I can think of no greater honor than for you to allow me to cradle the Messiah in my arms as his earthly mother. However, with the greatest of privileges came not only the greatest responsibilities, but also in this case, the severest of emotional pain to carry. Before the birth of Jesus, Mary was given honor as no other woman had by the angel Gabriel. Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. Luke chapter 1, verse 28, as well as verse 30. But here in Luke chapter 2, Mary is also told that she will suffer perhaps only as few other mothers had to endure. And we know this is referring to her witnessing the anguish of her son at Calvary's cross. Most of those who stood beneath and around the cross were anything but sympathetic to Jesus as he died there for them then and for us now. In fact, they came to mock rather than to mourn. They lashed out at him in contempt instead of lamenting over this miscarriage of justice that had taken place in their high court. They were vicious, jabbing him with their hurtful one-liners. Verbal abuse can be very painful emotionally as well as physical torment. The only encouragement and tender understanding that Jesus received as he bore the weight of the world's sins that came from only a small group of women and one single apostle, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Jesus faced alone the greatest evil ordeal that human history will ever record that was against God. Now one of those who was at the cross, possibly from the very beginning, was his mother, Mary, as well as four other women that were mentioned by name in John chapter 19, verse 24 or 25. Now she stood at the foot of the cross during the first three hours of the six-hour period of crucifixion and perhaps during the latter part of it, which was the time of the miraculous events, including the three hours of darkness, she might have withdrawn to a place farther away as Matthew 27 
verse 55 states, and many women were there looking on from a distance. During the first three hours on the cross, Jesus placed the well-being of his mother into the hands of John. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. John 19, verse 26 and 27. It's possible that John, now her caretaker or son, took Mary there to witness Jesus' death from a distance. After all, Mary had already watched what they did to her son. She had also listened to their foul remarks directed towards her precious offspring. Now with that, John the Apostle of Love was expressing compassion to his new mother, Mary. Well, let us ask, as Mary, the mother of the promised Messiah, stood near the cross, what did she see? Can you imagine what Calvary looked like from the viewpoint of a loving mother. Mary saw her son suffer the excruciating pain of crucifixion. No doubt that is what Simeon's early prophecy meant. A sword will pierce even your soul, Luke 2, 35. Jesus had been, in the highest sense, the perfect son to Mary. You couldn't find a better statement about Jesus than who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. No curse word ever had fallen from his mouth. He never back-talked to his mother. His heart never entertained the slightest sinful thought. Imagine having the perfect child to rear. Now, I've had mothers tell me that their kid was perfect. And that youngster was about the most rotten ever. But at the cross, Mary had to view Jesus die the most painful, public, and shameful death that any human in the darkest place of his soul could devise for his fellow man. Most likely, Joseph died before Jesus' public ministry as the Lord's stepfather is not mentioned in Jesus' adulthood. But Mary had chosen to come to the cross with a few of her supportive friends. Her children that had been fathered by Joseph were not there with her. James, Jose, Judas, and Simon did not accompany their own mother to this pitiful place of execution. But more surprising, her daughters did not appear to be with her so that they could assist her in bearing this most very intense sorrow that befell a mother in this crisis. We're amazed that her heart and body could bear such a weight of grief. It is for this reason that John, after Jesus spoke from the cross to both of them, may have even taken her home away from this awful scene near the end. The Bible is silent as to where Mary stood at the bitter conclusion of Jesus' physical death. How meaningful it must have been for Mary, for Jesus to speak to her from the cross. John would write, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son, chapter 19, verse 26. It seems her children by Joseph were not there. And you might think that Jesus would have turned Mary over to them. But Jesus entrusted her to John, a disciple of his, one that Jesus knew would completely do good to Mary. In the name of common sense, why would a Christian ever turn a loved one over to another that did not practice New Testament Christianity? Especially a child to be led into religious falsehood and then to end up dying lost in hell eternal. She had come to share his suffering and Jesus saw her. He pushed the great pain that he was experienced through the back of his mind and lovingly provided for the future care of the one who bore him, who carried him, and encouraged him into manhood, his dear mother. The last earthly responsibility that Jesus fulfilled was that of providing special care 
for his sweet mother. So first off, she saw her son suffer this pain of crucifixion. Secondly, Mary saw her son die for the sins of the world. Surely Mary had some understanding of what was actually taking place. If you recall in your Bible studies, at Jesus' birth, shepherds had come to the manger and had reported the appearance of angels who were singing, For today in the city of David, there has born, been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Now Luke goes on to record in verse 19. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Sometime later, in a house, Mary is visited by the Magi or the wise men who came to adore Jesus, presenting him with wonderful gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. She had heard Simeon as well as the prophetess Anna's prophecies concerning Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 38. She had beheld the marvelous miracles of Jesus, heard his strengthening spiritual sermons, and scrutinized his simple life as only a loving mother could. She had paid close attention to the growing tension and rejection of Jesus with the religious authorities. She probably, out of deep concern for the welfare of her son, had asked Jesus about many of these things. And he told her only what he thought she could and should understand. Mary, like others, did not understand everything about what Jesus was going through. Yet, as he daily approached closer to the shadow of the cross, his mission must have been clearer to her in some degree. Surely at the cross, Mary had reflections and recalled the appearance of the angel announcing Messiah that was going to be born to her. This heavenly being's words were too pointed for her not to understand. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the powers of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 35. So perhaps later on this very late part of Friday, she searches within herself and she says, I knew something was going to happen, but I did not know the details. I did not envision the agony and the shame of it. I now clearly see what all the prophecies meant. So secondly, Mary saw Jesus as the Savior of the world. Thirdly, Mary saw Jesus become her Savior. So the angel Gabriel told Mary that the child's name is to be Jesus in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. And an angel of the Lord told Joseph in a dream, and she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, verse 21. No, no doubt that Mary and Joseph, they compared notes about what they had received from these two angels. Perhaps they even talked over the meaning of the phrase, for he will save his people from their sins. How comforting it must have been for Mary to think that Jesus was dying so that she and the people of all the earth might have a savior from their sins. Now some falsely teach that Mary lived and died as a perpetual virgin and was without sin as God's grace protected her from sin and she therefore did not need a savior. Yet we find that Mary never acknowledged that she was sinless. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. 
That's Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47. Now this Greek word, sotar, for Savior, it means deliverer or preserver. Mary needed God as a Savior as any accountable person since her time and before. Now with all the out of ordinary events that surrounded her life because of Jesus, we don't know how much she truly understood or how many of these truths she managed in her mind. However, she must have grasped some of them and hugged them tightly in her heart as she watched the lifeblood leave her son. The resurrection confirmed the valid, valid uh, the validity I'm getting the word. There you go. Whatever she said, that's it. Of everything that she had come to understand. When the disciples gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem and they prayfully were waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit that had been promised to them by Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Mary was in that number assembled. After mentioning the apostles in Acts chapter 1, verse 13, we read verse 14 and 15. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And at that time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons. Now, although her daughters were not mentioned in the phrase, and with his brothers, that may be an inclusive expression referring to all of Mary's entire children, which would be sons and daughters. Mary did give birth to the Messiah, but at the cross, he became her Savior, who was dying so that she also could be saved from her sins. Well, let me illustrate this thought with the, from the English poet John Milton, who lived from 1608 to 1678. Now, Milton's biographer wrote that blindness fell upon Milton at the age of 43 like a sentence of death. He thought he had reached the end of everything, that life had nothing left for him. His heart was broken. His only comfort was the fact that in his ears, when he had eyesight, he had written a pamphlet on the English Civil War that occurred in 1642 to 1651, between the parliamentaries and the royalists. Now, the, bi the biographer remarked that about Milton, and this was his words, he could not foresee that in less than 10 years his pamphlet would be merged in the obsolete mass of Civil War tracts. And the only mention of it because it was written by the author of Paradise Lost. Milton's darkness proved a blessing. It gave birth to the great poet who then wrote, as a blind man, Paradise Lost. Even so, in an even greater way, with Mary, when she lost her firstborn son, she did that to find her Savior. Mary was truly one of the outstanding women of all time that happened to also become a great mother. How grateful we are to her for providing the motherhood that Emmanuel needed as Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. God needed an excellent home life for his son. So he chose Mary and Joseph to provide it, and they truly did. However, Mary eventually had to recognize that Jesus had moved from being her dutiful son to becoming her loving Savior. Mary saw this come to fulfillment as all the truths that she pondered over the years in her heart and perhaps in the words of Jesus that he uttered from the cross, not only that he was meaning it in reference to John, but also that she might have a thought of it in a different manner as well. Woman, behold your Savior Son on the cross. One of my teachers at Harding University was Eddie Clore, and uh, he makes this statement in an unpublished manuscript that he wrote, Unto Us a Child is Born. He says, Mary made up her mind concerning the way that she would go, 
And she went that way even though her journey went through Gabbatha with her son who was crucified. Uh, her journey uh, was crucified before her journey got to the sunlight morning of the resurrection. A faithful mother stays with God's mission, trusting in the faithfulness of God all along the way. End of quote. The Apostle Peter, in his Pentecost sermon, condemned the Jews for murdering Jesus in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, as you yourself know. This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. His mother, Mary, stood by him to the bitter end, as already mentioned, being present at his crucifixion. It is not surprising that she would stand by her son. She knew who he was and what great mission he was upon. She had stood by him in many other ways during her earthly ministry. Mary was a remarkable mother. As a mother, she stood by him during the most unusual circumstances of her pregnancy and childbirth. The highlights of Luke chapter 2, verse 4 to 7. And Joseph also went up to Galilee, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, in order to register along with Mary. And it came about that while they were there, she gave birth. And she wrapped him in cloth and laid him in a manger, which is a feeding trough, because there was no room for them in the inn. Under the same hard circumstances, if this work this event were to occur today, she would have been encouraged by the ungodly to have an abortion. So to be spared the shame and the inconvenience of an unwanted baby. Now can you imagine if she was like over a million women in America each year and had not seen the birth of her child through the nine month period? Where would the human race be? They would be without any hope and condemned to hell. As a mother, she stood by him during a very difficult, dangerous journey to Egypt when King Herod was on a rampage to murder the Christ child due to his jealousy of fear and losing the throne of his kingdom. The highlights of Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 to 23. And when they, the wise men, had come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then being divinely warned in the dream that, a dream that they should not return to Herod, they reparted for their country another way. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother. Flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Then when Herod saw that he had been deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all male children who were in Bethlehem and all of its districts from the age of two years and under. And when Herod was dead, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and go to the land of Egypt, for those who had sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose and took the young child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. And being warned by God in the dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. There are mothers today who abandoned their families for far less than what Mary endured in Matthew chapter 2. As a mother, she stood by him when a glimpse of his mission and destiny began to emerge at the age of 12. In Luke chapter 2, verse 48 to 52. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father 
and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And they did not understand the statement which he had said or made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God in men. Jesus gently informed Mary that there was a difference between the your father, Joseph, that Mary mentioned in verse 48, and the my father, God, that Jesus referred to in verse 49. Yet she was a normal earthly mother, and Jesus was still a submissive child. There are mothers today whose jealousy makes them resent a child that has a wholesome career that exceeds the achievement of the parents. Every mother and father ought to be excited when their offspring is able to cast a bigger shadow for good in life than they ever did. Let us always learn to be proud of their achievements. As a mother, she stood by with him in his per, per, uh, first public min, uh, min, uh, miracle, which was performed to launch his earthly ministry. The highlights of John chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. The head waiter tasted the water which had become wine. Jesus quietly began to withdraw himself from her authority as an earthly mother. In the Jewish culture, now at the age of 30 years, Jesus was considered a man to make his own mark or own plus sign in life. Mothers need to know how to let their children go while standing by to support them as needed. Mom, you have to learn to be able to kick them out of the nest for them to go and collect their own worms. As a mother, she stood by him when she explained, when he explained that others share a closeness to him without that relationship shutting her out. Now the highlights of Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 to 50, as well as Luke chapter 11, verse 27 to 28. Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But he answered, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards the disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever shall do the will of the Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. And one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast on which you nursed. But he said, On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Now these two passages teach the air of undue reverence to Mary and also refute the claim that she was a perpetual virgin and not bearing children to her husband, Joseph. These verses state that as great as Mary was, that we also can share in the same spiritual benefit that she did. And lastly, as a mother, she stood by his divine cause when he was no longer in her personal presence. As seen in Acts chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, which we mentioned earlier, the 120 disciples that were gathered together were going to be the core of the new church established in Jerusalem. It was up to all of them to remain faithful to every New Testament pattern that was given by the Holy Spirit. The pattern of salvation, the pattern of worship, the pattern of church organization, and all the other first century doctrines. Many, after having the shame of losing a child as Mary did, have allowed bitterness and deep hurt to bring them to say to God, I blame you for the death 
of my child. So I will serve you no more. Mary stood solidly by the tremendous New Testament cause that was so dear to her son. Because she knew that Jesus eventually would be victorious in the shedding of his blood at the cross to bring about very soon the New Testament church. She knew what the two angels had told the eleven apostles just after Jesus ascended to heaven. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have seen him go up into heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The 120, including Mary, knew that Jesus was returning in the Father's own good time to take all the redeemed of humanity from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22 to eternal heaven. Someone has wisely said Jesus was born in a virgin womb and was buried in a virgin tomb. Jesus was born in a stranger's cave and buried in a stranger's grave. Is this Jesus your Jesus? This Jesus can become the Lord and Savior of you as he did of Mary after she saw what she saw. Why not this morning allow Jesus to be your Lord and Savior too after what you have read and heard about him in regarding to the New Testament? In belief, repentance, as well water immersion for the forgiveness of your sins. Your sins are then washed away and the Lord himself will add you to his one New Testament church. So why not, if you're subject to his calling, if you need to respond in a public way, come and do that right now as together we stand.